Wine glass. When your mother found strands of your hair hung up in the feet of your comb, your father scrolled them into a wine glass. It bites him hard that your life happened like an hourglass with only a handful of sand. This split to the sim of his body, a split of darkness that wouldn't kill him but squeezes adrenaline into his veins so he leaves through the pain of your absence. He's not all right to speak. His voice rims with bereavement. And he wants to sing by your grave, child, now that birds blow songs through the window, count sadness on the prayer beads necklaced around his collar. If he had known the sky would inhale you out of him so quickly, he would have stayed with your toes forever in his hands. Your face is still everywhere, even in the places he is not looking. He presses a deep kiss on your grave, on your forehead, hands cloudy from rubbing the grave as if on your tender skin. The distance he feels is more than the 400 kilometers that often stands between you. He will travel this far to hold you against the moon. They say you are like his reflection, pulled out of the mirror he stares into. To pull you out, he plunges his hands inside himself and pulls. Um, I'll tell you a little story um, about Two weeks ago, I was um, driving back from Kroger for grocery shopping, and I had um, um, seen on the side of the road a deer um, that was just laying in the silence of before I realized um, death. Right, um, I'm in a tread of groves, dried grasses, um, just there on the side of the of the highway. And I, I pulled over a little bit ahead um, and walked back and sat there close to this dead deer. Um, and, and what I was thinking was whether it was one of the deers that come to our backyard every morning. Um, you know, like um, when I'm about to pray, I look out the window and I, I, I see these two deers. And in that moment, I was thinking, is this one of the deers? Because it was so close to the house. Um, and I thought, you know, like maybe it was hit on the road and somebody um, had taken it, um, you know, off the Russian traffic. Um, but in that moment, I started thinking about my own mortality. And it was surprising, you know, that I was um, in a state of mourning um, for a lack of a better language. I was grieving the death of this deer, um, which was something that I wouldn't do in the past, right? Um, because I, I didn't have a lot of connection to the animal side of, um, of nature. And I began to wonder, you know, what our presence as human beings are doing to animals, the way that our encroachment of their space is endangering them and how they must feel about our presence, you know, in, in this place that was bliss for them until we came along, right? And, you know, um, as we always do to plunder, you know, this ecosystem of, of, of theirs. Um, but another thing is I started thinking about my own um, mortality um, and what it means to be alive and what it means for me to be alive and my being alive to threaten, you know, some things that always fall off you know, my attention. And, and so I wrote a poem, you know, to, to respond to that personal question that I have and the emotion that I was feeling for this dear, you know, whose name I don't even know. Do they even have names? Um, so most of the times my writing lots of response to those kind of questions and it serves as, um, you know, a, 
a little space for me to reflect about my space in the world and how my taking up space also not just affect other human beings but also affect things that I'm not even paying attention to. Traveling is um, for me one of the most important part of learning. Um, it just arms us with insight that nothing else has the ability to um, and it's like creating distance from the things that you know we have taken for granted. Um, when I was moving to Mississippi, you know, a lot of people were like, do not go to the to Mississippi. And when I arrived here, you know, I was so excited about the things I was seeing because I, I felt really close to the to the environment, to nature. You know, like deers come to the yard, um, hummingbirds, you know, like um, come to the trees, um, cardinals, all of this, you know, part of nature that I wasn't aware of. You know, like now I'm in touch with. Now I'm on, you know, um, um, on internet, you know, googling about <laughs> birds, <laughs> and 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 so like, even when I talk to people here, like they're like, what about Mississippi? Do you like? I'm like, well, you know, I like the food, I like the environment. It's it's shocking that you know, like some people are surprised that you know, I like something. I don't know why um, um, they're surprised, but. But it's 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 been it's it's been great, and I, I realized you know like some of the things that I also overlooked when I was living in Nigeria, and I'm like maybe you know for some of the people who are you know surprised that there's something to like here, I imagine you know that they're living you know in in a state similar to my state when I was in Nigeria, where I was overlooking all the great things that was, um, you know, um, before me and, you know, like part of my growing up, part of my community, part of my culture. And because it's, it's always easy, um, you know, to be blinded by proximity, right? Each time people think, you know, like the closer something is, the better perspective you have of it, the better sight you have of it, but that's not necessarily true. Um, because, for instance, if you're standing in the front of a tall skyscraper, it's going to be difficult for you to have a complete grasp of what it looks like. Somebody who's, you know, from far away might would definitely have a better view of the of of even you know like the building, the beauty, and um, the general architecture. So uh, I see proximity in that way, and sometimes it you know like it gives good perspective to just you know like. Just leave <laughs> your comfort zone, um, and you would you would find out that you know things that you've considered mundane are actually things of incredible splendor, things that you have great sentimental attachment to. Learning about constellations. Today, Baha is not dead. She's twelve years old sits beside a flower vase, presses her tomb to the clay. Her heart bods into a magnificent sun. Water falls its warmth all over her satin face, taller than all her classmates. In the corner, she leans her head to white paper, carves moons out of her notebook while other children sit and listen to the teacher. The class is learning about constellations. She takes color off a flower, folds it to her skin, a chameleon gathering coats from leaves. She questions daisies, reveals all suggestions when he stares into her eyes. Baha grabs a speck of darkness, molds it into a moth, and places it in the darkest point in his eyes. He sits close to his daughter in the yard, joins her and the moths. Baha is not dead. She's walking her way into myth, a world of new constellations, where buried milk nourishes the placenta to heal his broken bones, broken eggshell of his heart. Mend each back together with the energy of a clock that never stops moving backward we're in a constant loop of storytelling 
um, every day. It's a new story. It's a new beginning. It's also a continuation of you know the the story of our Genesis. Um, as we are experiencing things, that's that's we engaged in you know um, a sort of storytelling, right? Because um, every day we go out in the world and experience things, and the difference between people who you know um, really tell their stories by ways of their art forms, whether it music, you know, sculpture, um, poetry, um, photography, is that they're so thrilled about a particular event that they think it worthy of capturing, right? They want to preserve it so that other people can engage with it and perhaps feel, you know, even if not fully, but, you know, part of their experience in the moment, right? Um, um, recently, in a class, we're having conversation about something similar, um, and I was saying, you know, like, there was a day um, that I was... Um, in a field, I, I love to play football. Um, if you're wondering, you know, like, I do not have the build. I mean, the real football, um, what you would call soccer. <laughs> and I was playing, and I was supposed to pass the ball to this person, but I'd raised my ha head up, and I had saw um, um, what I call a half-eaten moon, which is a new crescent moon, um, and I was so intrigued by that, um, that I didn't pass the ball. And they were so furious at me. But then, in my mind at that moment, I was thinking about both the sight of the moon and also a box of raisin that I had seen earlier in the day. And I had read on the box, it reads, I love raisins. And in that moment, my mind merged those two things together. I love raisins in the sight of half-eaten moons. That's like an insignificant part of a person's day. But those two incidences were the highlight of that day for me. Um, and so I embraced it, and I took it as relevant. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to write about raisins in the sight of this moon and what had happened on a football pitch. Um, so it's just value system. Everything is worthy of writing about, and it just depends on how you do it. But there are a lot of stories unfolding around us, and we're also a part of story. You know, our lives is a part of storytelling. And, and, and so it just, you know, depends if we want to write it for others to experience what we are experiencing or not. Yeah, so um, I enjoy walking a lot. Um, it's when I create more, is when I see more, is when I hear the music more. Um, and it just allows for me to be immersed in the beauty of nature um, and just gives me time to, to see how insignificant I am, you know, especially when I'm, you know, in the throes of Hebrews, right, that I think you know, um, I am something, you know, like just being out there and, you know, seeing the world um, humbles me um, and teaches me humility. Um, and so I enjoy it a lot because, you know, I, 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 there was a day that I wrote in, in my notebook and when I walk, I normally have, you know, like a small notebook or just my phone um, because I just walk around and I'm like, this notebook is the record, is the fossil record of my evening walk. Um, and I thought, you know, like, it's an interesting way to, um, to talk about, you know, all the things that I see, because really that's what I do. I walk around, I see things, and I try to transcribe, you know, the things that I'm seeing into a language that somebody can engage with. And, you know, like, at least, even if, I fail sometimes, but you know, like just give them a little insight of what I have seen. Um, and so <laughs> in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, there's like a lot of um, sidewalks um, and also bicycle trails. 
um, just woven around the underbelly of the city. And so I, I would say that, you know, like it allows me to go everywhere and, and just see and take down notes. Um, there was a day that I, I was walking by a, um, a train track <laughs> in Nebraska in a landlocked state, right? And there was a, 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 a skeleton of a, a trout fish. And I was like, how did you get here? How did you find your death here, right? Like, what are you doing out of water by a, a, a train track? And, you know, I, I, I have a habit of taking pictures of, you know, some of the images that I've seen. And I thought that would be interesting for a poem, um, but I've never been able to use that image. But I wrote it down, you know, like a trout, you know, like there was a, 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 a shrub you know, piercing out of the open mouth of it. Um, and they're like a lot of insects and, you know, just roaming around um, the, 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 the decomposing body of this fish, right? Like, and it, it was interesting. I think it's very easy for me to just conjure up lines of poetry and images when I just walk around because I see things. And sometimes, you know, um, people think it takes, you know, great talent um, to just write down poetry or, you know, like whatever. Um, the poets might not like this, but I think, you know, like once you just pay attention, you'd see that, you know, a lot of things are happening around you. Um, that when you just describe the thing that is before you, you know, you might have, you know, successfully written a poem. Memories by the Sea. Imagine a forlorn child conceive the sun that rouses the mouth of the universe. Imagine it disappearing into the throbbing throat of night. Imagine the dark seams, thick treads that binds voices to a giant vault of silence. Imagine him rubbing his fingers across your picture, trying to gloss your lips with words as you wander off into the horizon. Imagine your face, still a sky, peering down into his mind. Now, imagine the sun as a reverie, and there by a sea he is learning to fetch a bit of that firmament. Imagine this. When his mother says your shadow, it bed lambs inside his body. A seashell swallows the wave back into its depths. Imagine looking deeply until his reflection convinces you you can exist as a fraction outside his corneas. Imagine you are a star, thrancing in his thoughts. Imagine he disposes those thoughts about you in more thoughts about you. Imagine each time you feel like forgetting something about him. Even if insignificant, imagine glaring the blue zenith bordered in a surface mud by tides until memory split apart by the sea reassembles like a solved puzzle picture. How he wishes you imitate that multiplicity and grow into the right places that would hold you whole. He hears the night holds onto your voice like a basket finally able to hold water. Imagine he presses his feet against wet sand and slips through a footprint. Here is a mystery close to the shoreline, a portal. Here's the distance, the vast sea between your bodies. Your voice still alight, wading through the dark beyond the throes of separation. Imagine, imagine, imagine how you'd communicate from here on. Grieving is the only way he speaks of nothing. <laughs>